Welcome to worship this morning. We're so grateful that you are here in whatever form um, you've been able to join us. We know that so many of you um, join us. I, I know I do um, and my family as well. Um, we worship at the 10 o'clock hour um, in our living room. And um, I am so delighted when I see all of the views um, on the, uh, the YouTube um, uh, reflection that reflects uh, just how many people are worshiping with us at 10 o'clock. So I know so many of you do worship at 10 o'clock. Some of you are worshiping in the evening. Um, some of you are worshiping throughout the week. Um, and we're so grateful that um, this situation has led us to be more um, uh, present for you. Uh, perhaps your work life does not allow you to worship on Sunday mornings. And we're so grateful that we have learned just how to be present with you when you are ready to worship. And so I'd like to declare that this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I'm so glad that so many of you are here, and I'd love for those numbers that are reflected on YouTube um, to maybe have some names and faces. And so please um, consider uh, commenting below. You can even pause right now and comment on the YouTube stream, or you can also um, comment on the Facebook welcome, or you can text me, uh, email me, or um, especially if you're visiting with us for the first time, or you've been visiting with us and you'd like to be uh, more involved, um, please text the word welcome to 219-300-9877. That's our special church uh, uh, text cell phone number. And uh, why if you text welcome, then you will be um, uh, consistently welcomed by us. And we would love to have a chance to do that. My dear friends, in this time of Lent, we are discovering today just what or who is at our center and what difference that can make for our own selves and our own transformation and for the larger community and the transformation of the larger community. So let us now invite God to be within our center as we breathe in the very breath of God and allow our God to call us into this very sacred time. Let us now worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. <clears throat> day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
The call to confession. Confident in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy One, creator of the stars and seas, your steadfast love is shown to every living thing. Your word calls forth countless worlds and souls. Your love revives and refreshes. Forgive our misuse of your gifts that we may be transformed by your wisdom to manifest for others the mercy of our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Well, since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us then forgive one another and pass the peace of Christ to each other. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My dear friends, um, in the last few weeks, we have been um, participating in the ritual of fellowship. Of course, when we were in person and not so concerned with the germs that were being passed along the pew uh, while we had um, fellowship pads where we did uh, write our names and um, our contact information and we were able to see with whom we were worshiping. Well, the new um, high-tech way of participating in the ritual of fellowship um, could be just to comment below or to make a comment on the Facebook welcome. Send an email to me or a text to me, and especially if you are um, visiting with us, why you can um, text 219-300-9867. And a lot of you have chosen at this point um, to send a message saying, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And it's so wonderful to respond back to you in different ways. So I do um, pray that you will share the peace of Christ with those um, with whom you are worshiping, or maybe you might share the peace of Christ um, throughout the week um, with um, family and friends, those who you may see along the way or call or um, maybe even write to. Let's celebrate Christ by sharing the peace of Christ. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The first scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. <clears throat> Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear witness, false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture this morning, I'm going to be reading from my devotional. Perhaps you have this one. Um, those of you who are living in um, senior residences or um, perhaps um, those of you um, in uh, families with younger children, you might have received this one. It has good activities and good um, discussion questions. And I'm hoping to connect with um, some of you this week or next regarding some of these discussion questions within this devotional. Matthew 19, verses 16 to 26. Listen now to the word of God. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother also, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Oh, when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, well, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, well, for mortals, it is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in this story, this rich young man may have gotten more than he asked for. For he only came up to Jesus saying and asking, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? The writer of our um, red devotional, um, you know, sort of um, imagines what might be happening here for this young man. Uh, for when Jesus... Um, asks him if he's kept the commandments. Um, he says, yes, yes, I have, but, but what must I do? And so the writer for our um, devotional imagines that maybe he's looking for something more, 
something more above the, the script, the following of this check, following of this check, what's more? And it's my assessment that maybe <laughs> Jesus might have given him more than he was really asking for because he had come up to him just saying, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus kind of ups the expectations and really <laughs> ups the, um, the deeds that this young man must do. For he not only responds what should you do to be good, he actually says, if you want to be perfect, and there's, you know, a question about whether or not the young man really had asked <laughs> what he should do to be perfect. Want to be perfect, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Now, many people question just what was going on within that man's mind as he slowly turned away. And of course, the writer of our, do our devotional um, has some theories that maybe um, when he uh, walked away, was he considering the idea of selling his possessions um, that he couldn't bear to part with? Um, was it the idea of giving the profits to the poor? Um, not only would he not have his stuff, but he also wouldn't earn anything to make a return on his investment. Was he considering that he, as our devotional writer <laughs> points out, that maybe he couldn't actually carry out the Ten Commandments if he were to sell all he had because he couldn't honor his father and mother by caring for them if he had nothing with which to care for them. This is complicated. The writer also asks, could it be that he left to consider maybe for the first time where his heart was? We've been talking about the treasure that we follow and where our heart is. You might've seen in your bulletin um, that we're talking about the center this morning. And I even found a picture for the front of the bulletin of um, the center for a basketball team. And while according to, you know, it's, it's, it, it isn't the best analogy because um, if you were to do your research, um, the center is not considered the most important position to play, it's actually the point guard, because the point guard um, will get the ball and will know all of the plays and will know exactly who to throw the ball to. And yet, as I was thinking about this analogy of basketball, I was thinking, well, then the point guard represents us, our brain, our decision-making. And of course, um, this analogy isn't perfect, so please do not <laughs> scrutinize my theology just from this one um, uh, <laughs> analogy. But I was thinking, you know, okay, so if we are the point guard, then we need to know, we need to know where our center is. The center that is going to make those points, catch the ball even when the throw is from the furthest part of the court. The center is going to rebound and get possession of the ball back. And we need to know who our center is in order to even know who to throw it to. Following the Ten Commandments and taking the first step towards selling all we have and giving it to the poor. Because of course, Jesus says, you know, well, with humanity, this is impossible. With God, it is possible. And so we, in our lives, we're on a spiritual journey of understanding that we can't take it with us, right? 
that these possessions that we have, they won't be with us forever, but our soul Our soul belongs to God. And our relationship with God is what is eternal. And so perhaps that first step toward asking God, because as, as Reformed theologians, of course, we're not going to do this on our own, right? Asking God to lead us to better follow the commandments of God which as Christians have been boiled down to love God and love neighbor. The first step toward releasing the power that our possessions have over us is to do what any good coach is going to coach the point guard to do, and that's to know who the other players are. what her name is and what her name is and where the center is. Lent is a time where we slow down. And I don't know about you, but I forgot this week to slow down. <laughs> and as I was preparing for this sermon and looking through the devotion, I thought, wait a minute, are we already in week three? Week three of Lent, I've forgotten to meditate. I've forgotten to slow down. I've forgotten to breathe. And yet Lent is that time to back up, to consider just where our center is. And to ask God to reform some things. To maybe rid our minds and our spirits and maybe even our cluttered desks or cluttered living rooms. Of all those things that seem to take over when we desire so much. For God to be at the center. You know, one thing I have done followed a Lenten practice that um, I started right there on Ash Wednesday. And it was a promise that I made to God and to myself and to you, my parishioners, that each day I spend in the office and do my work in the office, I'll spend about a half an hour singing the Psalms. And I got to tell you, this last week, the tasks of ministry became so much that I actually heard myself say to myself, I don't have time to do that. That'll be a waste of time. I shouldn't be in the sanctuary singing. I get joy out of that. Ha <laughs> ha. The joy of being connected with God. And somehow the list of things to do, the list of people to call, the list of reports to write, somehow transforms when God helps me to find my center in God's grace in singing those Psalms at the piano, communing with God. You know, I used to somewhat not, um, I used to somewhat uh, not like the first question of the Westminster Catechism. And for those of you who are cradle Presbyterians and perhaps um, major confirmation here in this church or maybe in, in another Presbyterian church or maybe in a Reformed um, church, you had to memorize the question and answer. What is the chief end? And I'm going to put my own reflection here. What is the chief end of humankind? And the answer is 
to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And I have to admit, as a young idealistic Christian, maybe in my teens, I remember hearing that um, question and response during my own confirmation. And I sort of didn't like it because I thought, well, what difference does that make? I started to um, imagine somebody who maybe in their own personal life, you know, um, might uh, take advantage of others um, or maybe um, spend a lot of time lying or, um, or cheating um, their way through life. Um, but they glorify God and enjoy God and that's all that matters. And I remember thinking, well, there's nothing transforming about that. That's not very Christian. And then, you know, when I got really zealous about, um, uh, which is not a bad thing, about, um, you know, the social gospel and the social transformation um, that comes from the Christian community, I thought, well, dear me, we could be a, a bunch of Christians glorifying God and enjoying God, but not worrying at all about, uh, not doing anything about um, systemic racism or poverty or um, uh, the, the, the um, um, viable community around us. And then as I got older and studied theology a little bit more, it became apparent to me that one cannot glorify God and enjoy God without being transformed by God toward living a disciplined life within the way that God desires for us. And so as we consider the journey of this young man who came and asked Jesus, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. Let us then walk with him, knowing that with God it is possible. It's not going to be from some extra gumption within us. It's not going to be about us working harder toward being a better Christian. It's that idea of don't work harder, work smarter. No, don't work harder, work toward knowing what your center is. From where do your decisions get made? Are your decisions based upon worldly things or are your decisions based upon your time with God? Because your time with God is something that you have made so important that it is at the center of your life. Whether your time with God is at every red light on your way to work or whether or not your time with God is before or after each one of your meals. Whether your time with God is that traditional um, morning time before the day becomes busy or maybe it's the evening time when the whole world is hushed and you can focus on that center. You know, in my Lenten readings, I came across a quote from Soren Kierkegaard saying that Jesus the Christ consistently used the expression follower he never asks for admirers, worshipers, or adherents. No, he calls disciples, followers of a life Christ is looking for. Christ understood that being a disciple was in innermost and deepest harmony with what he said about himself. And what then is the difference between an admirer and a follower? A follower is or strives to be what he admires. An admirer, however, keeps himself personally detached, right? But a follower strives to be, looks to that center, asks God for the patience and the wisdom to look to the center, which is God. 
the follower will allow God to have a claim upon him or her. And finally, the admirer never makes any true sacrifices. He or she plays it safe. Though in word, he or she is inexhaustible about how highly he or she prizes Christ. But renounce is nothing and will not reconstruct their life and will not let their life express what they supposedly admire. You know, as our writers in both devotions, the purple, the purple devotion and the red devotion, the writer reminds us that nobody is perfect. And this sermon is not one of those that's asking you to be perfect. This sermon is a reminder for all of us to ask our God to lead us on this path in Lent this path where we will distance ourselves from that which is fleeting. Like we said a few weeks ago, that which wrath, moth can consume and come ever closer to the center. And as the point guard, knowing where that center is, and keeping that center at the center. This is part of our discipline as Christians. And may God lead us this way. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
My dear friends, we are now called to respond to God's good work by giving of our gifts and our talents. In this um, time of worshiping distantly, and even when we go back in person, um, we will be worshiping in a hybrid method. And so um, I want to remind you that you can send a check to the church address, and you can also use the PayPal link that is on our church website, which can be found at www.fpcmicity.org. And then if, um, you can click giving or you can just write slash giving right after fpcmicity.org. And you'll be directed to our PayPal link where you can safely um, make your electronic offering. And no um, fees will be taken from that offering. It will all go um, to the general fund. That, of course, um, is a fund uh, which um, serves the ministry of this congregation as we reach out to our neighbors, serves the ministry of this very technology that is bringing the worship to you wherever you are serves the ministry of education, the ministry of feeding, the ministry of worshiping, and the ministry of calling our God to be at our center. So let us reflect that which is our center by giving of our very selves.
something of the highlight of the concerns of the church is that we will be worshiping in person, of course, with uh, social distancing and masks, but we will be worshiping in person on March the 28th, which is Palm Sunday. So please look forward to that Sunday, whether you will join us through a live presentation through YouTube, maybe join us later in the week with the recording of that presentation, or perhaps you will join us right here in these pews as we worship our God on that glorious Palm Sunday. Um, please be looking for more information about that Sunday in the weeks to come. And of course, I am delighted to tell you that a concern of our church this morning is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. I will tell you that everyone is invited. All of those who believe of the Lord Jesus Christ are invited to this supper. It matters not if you're Presbyterian. It matters not if you are in Michigan City. For only Jesus is the host of this table, and I am merely serving here. All are invited. We are told in scripture that they will come from east and west and north and south to sit at table with the people of God. We are told in the gospel according to Luke, it was when Jesus broke the bread, then their eyes were open and they recognized Jesus there in their midst. And so I pray that wherever you are worshiping, as the bread is broken, that you will recognize Jesus among you. Let us now prepare for the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us now pray. Gracious and holy God, it is indeed right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. We thank you for your creation, especially in this time when winter is moving closer and closer to spring. We are grateful for the beauty of the snow, and we are also grateful for the first signs of spring around us. Gracious God, we thank you for your creation. And we thank you that you created us in your image. And even when we rebelled against your image, you sent prophets and martyrs along the way. And in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus the Christ to live as one of us. We thank you that he broke bread with outcasts and sinners and called all to live in the way of you through him and the Holy Spirit. We remember his sacrifice upon the cross, and we thank you that he was obedient, obedient even unto the cross. And so we do pray that the Holy Spirit be upon this bread that we break and this cup that we bless. We pray the prayers that have been lifted this morning. We pray for Louise Durflinger, for Sally Hooper, for Martha Rapp, for Judy Ringo, for Shirley Ryan, for Chris Winninger, for Marge Winfield and Bill Winfield. We pray for Barb Benson, who is still recovering from a back surgery, and we are so grateful to hear her reflections of how well that recovery is going. We pray for our congregation and we pray, our, pray for our military and their families and our AmeriCorps and Peace Corps workers and their families. 
And we pray for our world as the entire world continues to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. In Christ, through Christ, the unity of the Holy Spirit. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who while on this earth did teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My dear friends, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, you do declare the Lord's life and death and resurrection until he comes again. Come now, the joyful feast of the people of God has now begun. Dear friends, I hope that you've had a chance to partake of your bread where you are. Indeed, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Now let us pray once more. Gracious God, may we who have received the sacrament live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your gifts to all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear friends, now may we be led by God at our center, led by God to go out into the world in the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the compassion of the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen and go in peace.